Good morning, everyone. You want to say good morning? Good morning. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome to worship the Centennial uh, St. Anthony Park. We are so glad you're here. Please stand and sing with us.
God, thank you for the opportunity to come to this place as a body of believers, as a group of people wanting to serve and respond to the love that you have shown us. God, thank you that this is a place that healing and grace, forgiveness, and all these things that we talk about are made possible through your Son. But furthermore, God, thank you that this is a place that we don't keep those things, but try to respond in a way that offers them to other people that we come, come in contact with in our daily lives. God, help us to work for justice. Help us to respond to kindness and offer love the best we can in every situation. So your sons, let me pray these things. Awesome. All right. Good morning, church. That was all right. That was all right. I think we could do better. Good morning, church. Good morning. There we go. <laughs> it is so great to see you all here today, those who are worshiping with us in person and online. Whether this is your first time or your 101st time, you are welcome here. And we are so grateful each and one of you here are gathered today, both in person and online. Welcome to Centennial, where our mission is to be authentic, thinking, active disciples of Christ who go out and build loving and just communities. Um, please fill out our connect card. It's that QR code up there. It tells us who's here, what you need, and how we can be praying for you. I'm Amanda Schultz. I am the Director of Community Engagement and Youth Ministry, and we are so grateful for all those who supported our youth ministry at our breakfast cook-off last week. Uh, we raised over $1,400 for youth missions, so woohoo! That was between both campuses, um, and Tessa Harvey is here today, and they were the first place winner of our with their brownie bites. So woohoo for Tessa! Yay! Awesome. Okay, so thank you again so much for supporting Youth Missions. You have one other opportunity this month to support our Youth Mission trip to Illinois and our Summer of Service projects. Um, you can sign up to get your own Super Bowl sub sandwich which the orders are due this Friday. Um, so there are orders back, back in, in the way back, or they're also on social media. You can see, find the link pretty close if you're watching with us online. So you can fill that out with what kind of sub you want, bring your payment next Sunday, and you will have a delicious sub to eat before the, before the Super Bowl. Um, and they're huge, just so you know. They're like really big. So please, um, please help us uh, with our youth missions, and thank you for supporting youth missions through these great opportunities. Uh, we also have Lent kits for families with fifth graders or younger. Those will be available February 19th, so that's two Sundays from now. If you'd like a kit or extra kits for grandkids or neighbors or relatives, friends, somebody you met at Target that could use a Lent kit, uh, please sign up before next Sunday. <laughs> Children welcome, are welcome now to head down for Faith Walk, which is our version of Sunday school. So there they go, stampeding that way. They are also welcome to join us and continue on in worship with us here. Um, everybody is welcome, no matter where you find yourself today. So thanks for being here. We have two uh, scripture passages, one from the Old Testament, the prophet Micah, chapter 6, verses 6 to 8. With what shall I come before the Lord and bow myself before God on high? Shall I come before God with burnt offerings, with calves a year old? Will the Lord be pleased with thousands of rams, with ten thousands of rivers of oil? Shall I give my firstborn for my transgression, the fruit of my body, for the sin of my soul? God has told you, O mortal, what is good, and what does the Lord require of you, but to do justice and to love kindness 
and to walk humbly with your God. And from Paul's first letter to the church in Corinth, the 13th chapter, listen for the word of God. If I speak in the tongues of humans and of angels, but do not have love, I am a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. And if I have prophetic powers and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have all faith so as to remove mountains, but do not have love, I'm nothing. If I give away all my possessions and if I hand over my body so that I may boast, but do not have love, I gain nothing. Love is patient. Love is kind. Love is not envious or boastful or arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way. It is not irritable. It keeps no record of wrongs. It does not rejoice in wrongdoing, but rejoices in the truth. It bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never ends. But as for prophecies, they'll come to an end. As for tongues, they will cease. As for knowledge, it will come to an end. For we know only in part, and we prophesy only in part. But when the complete comes, the partial will come to an end. When I was a child, I spoke like a child. I thought like a child. I reasoned like a child. And when I became an adult, I put an end to childish ways. For now, we see only a reflection, as in a mirror. But then we will see face to face. Now I know only in part. Then I will know fully, even as I have been fully known. And now faith, hope, and love remain. These three, and the greatest of them is love. May God add a blessing to this reading of the word. So early in our uh, <clears throat> marriage, Carol and I were living in Youngstown, Ohio, and we were expecting our first child, who turned out to be Levi, though we didn't know it at the time, because in those days you didn't know stuff like that ahead of time. But we did know that Carol was committed to doing a, a traditional um, natural childbirth, and we knew that she didn't want to be sedated, and so we had to do Lamaze training. Anybody remember that? Anybody do that? They would go and they would teach you how to breathe in such a way that fathers wouldn't lose their minds and mothers wouldn't be succumb to their hideous discomfort. So this... Uh, Catholic Hospital arranged for uh, somebody to come in and do, they kind of slipped it in sideways to do a parenting seminar that was part of Lamaze training. And uh, I'm pretty sure that this person was not a Roman Catholic, and she was certainly not a nun, um, because she clearly had some experience parenting herself. And she shared something that was, became like the foundation stone for the way that Carol and I uh, parented, and we have shared this insight with numerous people over the years, but she said that there are basically three ways that you can parent, and one of them is a really good way. <laughs> she said, the first kind of parenting is authoritarian parenting, the parenting where mom and dad know best, and they set down the rules, and the kids had better, be had better obey those rules, or there would be consequences. It's a kind of parenting that says, because I said so, because I know best, because I'm the dad, those kinds of things that maybe some of you remember from your own experience. She said, that's not the best way to parent. And she said a lot of people think that the alternative, the only alternative to that kind of parenting is permissive parenting, which basically boils down to not really requiring anything of your children, anything goes, not giving them any guidance because you don't want to crush their spirit. She said, that's not the best way to parent either. She said the way to parent is, and she called it, and we've called it ever since, authoritative 
parenting. Parenting based on a respect that the parent earns by being patient, by being faithful, by being consistent, by being loving, by being forgiving, by walking the walk alongside the child. A kind of parenting that is based on teaching your child values that when you first begin to teach them, they're not even capable of understanding or putting together what it is that you're talking about. And the primary one of those is empathy. You want an older child and an adult to make decisions about how they will behave in the world based on how your actions will affect another person, how they will feel when you act in a certain way. And you begin talking about empathy. You begin asking the question, how will that make your brother feel long before the child has a brain in place that is capable of of putting themselves outside themselves and making that kind of an evaluation. Because as you're saying that over and over again and demonstrating and modeling that over and over again, their brain is growing, adding neuron to neuron and brain cell to brain cell and periodically rearranging them into new structures until one morning on a day that you can't predict, your child's brain will be capable of understanding empathy. And then suddenly, the question, how will that make Susie feel, is a meaningful question. And it becomes a question that shapes and forms the moral choices of that child well into adulthood. It's a kind of parenting that's not based on rules and laws and obligations. It is a kind of parenting based on core values. Actions based on who I know myself to be, not based on what I know to be wrong or right or acceptable or unacceptable or can, that it might bring me un discomfort and punishment or reward and so forth. So it, if you think about it, you know, I'm an adult. I've been raised already. Um, my parents basically used a form of authoritative parenting. Um, there was never, you wait till your dad gets home, you'll be sorry. That never was a thing that got said in my house. So I'm an adult, and I'm thinking about the reasons why I might not commit murder. So there are a couple of reasons why, and probably many reasons why I might not do that. I might not do that because there's a really good chance that I could get caught and that I could spend the rest of my life in prison and that that would be uncomfortable and frightening and scary to me. So in order to avoid that bad thing, I don't harm other people just to be safe. I might get away with it. Chances are I wouldn't. That's one way I might make that decision. If I made my decisions that way, would I in fact be a moral person? Would I in fact be, I mean, just because I don't actually harm someone, am I a moral person or am I just a person who's watching out for, to make sure I don't suffer unpleasant consequences? Another way I might make that decision is the knowledge that whether I like a person or not, whether they're like me or not, whether um, I can cooperate with them or not, whether I agree with them or not, every person that I encounter is valuable, is precious, because they reflect, they embody the image of God within them. Even when they're misbehaving, even when their, their behaviors are not convenient to me. But I don't harm them not just because I might be punished if I do, but because there is intrinsic value in who they are. When I make a decision that way, out of the core value that human beings are precious and made in the image of God, I am making an actual moral decision. I am being a person, a moral person, because I'm working from my core values, not simply my self-interest. I'm not following the rules. I am acting out of my core values. 
Now, the kind of parenting I described is not always convenient, and it's not always easy, and it requires enormous amounts of patience. And sometimes that patience, you know, even the best of us, and I would include in the category of the best of us, my wife Carol, uh, who was very consistent, very loving, very, you know, clear. One day, uh, one of the twins, Jonah, of course it was Jonah, um, was 13, and he was pushing all of Carol's buttons. She wanted him to do something, and he was outlining one at a time all the reasons why it wasn't his job or that she didn't ask soon enough and he had made other plans. And, you know, all of these very logical reasons why he ought not to have to do this thing that Carol was asking her to do. And she'd had a very long day. And she was a little frustrated and a little short on resources. And finally, she just sort of snapped and through gritted teeth, she says, Jonah, can't you ever do something just because I asked you to? And Jonah got this little smirk, this half smirk on his face that Jonah is sort of famous for. And he said, you're the one who taught me to question authority. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, that was a clear one for Jonah. And even his mother laughed when he said that. Uh, and to Jonah's credit, and this is very Jonah also, having scored the point, <laughs> having you know, won the argument, he went ahead and did the thing that his mom wanted him to do. <laughs> because for Jonah, it was all about this. It still is a little bit all like this. He married somebody who would do this with him. So, and they're very happily married. So, you know, being Jonah's parent was never convenient. Um, it wasn't always easy. But when I look at all three of my sons, you know, they love justice and kindness, and they walk humbly with God, and they are full of patient love of the kind that Paul describes in his letter. So I tell these stories to kind of, how do we make our decisions? How do we live a moral life? And there are whole huge swaths of the Christian church who are, yes, our brothers and sisters, but they build their lives on rules and regulations, things you must do in order for God to love you and accept you and save you, and things you must never do, you know, following the rules and never touching the core values or articulating the core values about why they do what they do and why they decline to do the things they decline to do. Did you notice about um, that from that text from Micah? It's a very familiar text. We've heard it a bunch of times. We're kind of a liberal justice, kind of social justice-y kind of congregation, so we love that passage. But listen to it carefully, and you'll realize that there are no obligations. There are no rules embedded in that. In fact, it asks this kind of rhetorical question about what do I owe to God? If I go to God and worship, what do I bring? And I think he's thinking worship in a much larger context, really, than just ritual worship. He's thinking kind of metaphorically about a whole life with what do I come before God? And then he starts with kind of normal things like a burnt offering. And, you know, and then, he, then he goes on to, how about ten thousands of rams? How about you know, thousands and thousands of rivers of oil? He's, getting kind of, he's going right to the edge. Will that satisfy God? And then he says this almost unspeakable thing. Shall I give the fruit of my body, my firstborn, the fruit of my body for the sin of my soul? This isn't just hyperbole. I mean, it is in the course of his argument. But there were religions surrounding the Jews at this time and before that actually did practice infanticide as a form of worship. The god Moloch, who was an important part of the pantheon in Babylon, his worship space was, a, was basically an oven built like a person, arms outstretched to receive an offering. And living persons were rolled down those arms 
into the flames. So this is a thing they know. And, and the story that a lot of us cringe from, every so often I find Carol with her Bible open and a pair of scissors in her hand, and I know she's open to the story of the sacrifice of Isaac because she hates that story. That's, that's hyperbole too. That doesn't really happen. But she does hate that story. Um, but the reality is that that story exists to describe who God isn't in the face of who some of these other gods actually were. Where uh, God commands Abraham to bring Isaac, his only son for whom he's waited 80 years. You know, it's like everything about uh, Abraham's life, future, his aspirations, his hopes, everything is embodied in this child who he loves from top to bottom. And God says, you've got to sacrifice him. And Abraham agrees, and we all wonder whether that was a good thing or a bad thing on his part, but he does. But then at the last moment, God offers a, a sheep or a ram for the sacrifice, and, the, and that twist is meant to say people are of value. People are precious. Your firstborn is precious. I don't require him from you. And so Micah is playing off that story. Shall I bring my firstborn? Offer the fruit of my body for the sin of my soul. So it brings her right to the edge, and the answer is a resounding no. You're only required to embody these three core values as a response to what God has done in your life. This is the form of your life. This is the form of your worship. Do justice. And in the Old Testament, among the prophets, doing justice is not like legal justice. It's social justice. It's caring for the widows and the fatherless, for the strangers, for the outcasts. Do justice. Love kindness. And walk humbly with God. These aren't rules. These are core values. When you walk out into your life and have to make decisions in every in situations, you're not going to follow those three rules. You're going to explore those three core values and out of them make decisions about what does it mean to do justice? What does it mean to love kindness? What does it mean to be humble in the presence of God? They're core values, and, and they are functional in every encounter that you have in your life. Rules, are unfortunately, are kind of specific. You know, don't do this, or do that, or don't do this under these circumstances. A core value serves you in every circumstance. And Paul, in his letter to Corinth, makes it really clear, like, what is the central core value? The one that, you know, the one ring that rules them all. Um, and it is love. It is love. And he's, you know, he's not, a pro he doesn't have a problem with prophecy. He's not like anti-prophetic. But he says, you know, prophecies will fail. I mean, they'll fade away. And tongues, you know, he's all about people talking in tongues. And, you know, but he said, that's going to cease. That'll be over. And knowledge, that'll get you so far, but no further. It'll end. And when all of that stuff is gone, the only thing that will be left is love. And at the end of his letter, he says, these three things, faith, hope, and love, remain. And the greatest of them is love. We Presbyterians, and I don't know about you Wesleyans, but I'm guessing you'll probably buy in on it too once you get the concept. <laughs> But, you know, we often ask ourselves, like, how do you interpret Scripture? How do you know which interpretations of Scripture are correct and which ones are false? Like, what are the rules that you bring to the process? We call it hermeneutics. What do you, what do you bring to the process of hermeneutics? How do you determine whether someone's interpretation of Scripture is correct? And for us, the, the number one filter that we bring to that process. There are others that follow it, but the number one is the rule of love. If a particular interpretation of Scripture defies the rule of love, if you cannot see in that interpretation 
the love that God has for us and the love that God calls us to have for each other, then that interpretation is false because it doesn't pass the test. And we Presbyterians back in the time of, the, of abolition and the, the Civil War argued about the morality or immorality of human enslavement. And there were people, especially living in the South, Presbyterians living in the South, who argued that there are all these references in Scripture to slavery, all of, most of which are like neutral about it, and, and the other ones are actually positive about it. Like there's 450 or some actual you know, references to slavery. And those Presbyterians in the South were arguing that because Scripture has this out here as at least a neutral and sometimes cases a positive value, that the enslavement of other human beings was moral. The, the folks in the North, and, and ever since all the rest of us in the, in the future of that time, um, applied the rule of love to that interpretation of Scripture and realized it doesn't matter how many times it gets mentioned in Scripture, it fails the test of love. Love is a core value. And it is a core value that you can bring to judge, maybe not Scripture itself, but the ways in which people interpret and understand Scripture. If it doesn't point to the love that God has. So it's critical that we who call ourselves Christians in the Wesleyan tradition are clear about what those biblical core values are. That we look and see, we read the stories, and we uh, you know, explore the arguments, and we listen carefully, not so that we can know what to do. Not looking for things we're allowed to do and things we're not allowed to do, things we must do and things we mustn't do, but to look for the very nature of God. Who is this God? And what does this God value? And what does this God require of us as we live our lives in the world? That's why as we are doing this core values process in, a, in preparation for making a new governance structure for Centennial, one that will allow us to move more quickly and more agilely to address new ministries and new works of justice and compassion, that we're looking closely at what are our core values, and not just looking, but articulating. So that when we, later when we say, what shall we do? Shall we do this thing? We can just look at them and say, that is part, that does reflect our core values, or it does not. And it's critical that our core values not just be what seems happy to us in this moment of 2023, but to look deeper to where the roots are gone deep to the Wesleyan tradition and beyond that into the New Testament and the Old Testament. The places where we go to ask, answer the question, who is God and what does God want of us and need from us? It's harder than just following the rules. It requires more investment. It requires more thought. And sometimes it requires harder decisions, more difficult decisions. But it's the thing that God is calling us to be and to do. Beings who act out of our most basic core values. People who seek justice and love kindness and are humble in the presence of God. People who love Amen. Family of faith, it is our time of offering. And so we would invite you to give and give joyfully in response to all that God has given us in Jesus. There will be ushers that will come, walk amongst us passing plates. There's a text to give option as well as a QR code that will take you to our giving page. If you filled out a paper version of our Connect card, which you can find in your seat backs, I would invite you to also throw those into the plate. But let us give and give joyfully. Amen.
As the ushers continue to pass the plates, I would call your attention to this table, this table that God prepares for us in Jesus. Family of faith, we are called to a core value of love and in a practice as people here to practice faith, right? We come together to worship, to pray, to listen to one another, to sing next to one another, to listen to scripture, to think and pray, and to gather at this table. We are building up and learning those core values of love, of invitation, of forgiveness and call. And so we come to this table to remember Jesus. To remember that on the night when he was to be betrayed, he gathered with his disciples in the upper room. And though they all faced, whether they knew it or not, significant transition, significant loss, significant change, and a delve into the unknown, they gathered together to experience grace and love family. In the middle of supper, Jesus took a loaf of bread. He blessed it. He broke it. He gave it to his disciples and invited them to take and eat, saying, this is my body. This is my whole self given for you. Every time you eat of this bread, he said, remember that. Remember me. When the supper was over, he took the cup blessed it, he gave it to his disciples and invited them to simply drink, saying this is the cup of the new covenant poured out for you and for many, for all, for the forgiveness of sins. Every time you drink of this cup, he said, remember that. Remember me. Family of faith, let's pray. Spirit of the living God, fall afresh on all of us gathered here person or online. Fall afresh on all the names and places and faces that are on our hearts in prayer, especially today. For all those who are grieving, for all those who are asking for help, for all those who are lost, for all those who are trying our best. Fall afresh on us and instill in us life fall you afresh, O Spirit of God, on these simple gifts of bread and cup. Make them be for us, the body and blood of Christ, so that we may be the body of Christ that is sent out into this world to bring your love, to meet your love, and to experience liberation. We pray all of this in the name of Jesus, the Christ, our brother and Savior, our Lord's prayer as he taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, and thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Family of faith, these are the gifts of God. For you, for me, for us, for all, for the people of God. I would invite the communion service to come forward, and as they prepare to serve you, I would remind you that no matter who you are, what you've done, where you come from, or what has been done to you, you are welcome at this table. This table is for you, from God, with love and grace. Let us receive. Amen.
about uh, biblical core values, I think, or are we talking Wesleyan, Wesleyan core values in the pastor's office down the hall, and Alan is an amazing uh, small group facilitator, so I think you'll enjoy it. Um, and now, may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the power and the companionship of the Holy Spirit be with each one of us both now and forever. And all God's people said... Thank <laughs> you. 